Good afternoon. I thought you know that in the betting pool this morning, the Consolidated University betting pool, more money was placed on there being more people at the open forum at noon at GHSU because there was food involved <laughs> than people here at 3 o'clock and there's no food. But all those people lost money. <laughs> Good to, see, good, to see so many of you, good to see so many of you here. Uh, this is, I don't have to count the number of, of these forums that we've had, but this is, this is for me, uh, I think my next to last one. I don't, know that, I don't know what to say about that, except that we're, we're moving on, and it's so good to see so many of you. But before we actually start with the open forum, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Carol Richley to make some important announcements, the plural announcements. But I'll make one first. <laughs> Memorial Day is indeed a holiday. All right. Campus is closed, no classes. Uh, now, Dr. Richley. Uh, as many of you know, we have been involved in a search for a new dean for the College of Education. And it is my great delight, I'm probably as excited as anybody except perhaps Paula Dahoney, to introduce to you today uh, Dr. Cindy Champ. Cindy, if you stand up so people can get you. And the second announcement is, as you know, we are, are moving forward in taking the Pamphlet College of Arts and Sciences and dividing it into two pieces. The name of those two pieces have yet to be determined, and college faculty in the uh, College of Arts and Sciences currently, I will be soliciting input from you shortly in terms of what you think those names should be. But in the meantime, we know that whatever the science piece of it will be, we'll have a new dean, and I'm very pleased to announce at this time that we have someone who has agreed to step in as an interim dean while we do a national search. And that person is Dr. Sam Robinson. That's good. Now, where else do uh, new administrators get applauded as though they were on a game show or something? Or <laughs> uh, just won a football match, football game. Anyway, right, right, great. Uh, this is our forum. Uh, I want to say before we start that, that Dr. Z is. Uh, has been really working hard today. He started out early this morning his radio interview. He had a meeting with the president's cabinet at Augusta State University. He had a meeting with the faculty policies committee. We had had some other meetings, and we had the forum at noon down at George Health Sciences University. He had four meetings, and now he's here, and he's still alive. Uh, and uh, but it's been a busy day for him. So I thought, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll just start this off. And we'll see what. Now, so here we are. It's uh, it's May the 16th. Uh, we're looking forward to this creation of a brand new university that will replace both Georgia Health Sciences University and Augusta State University uh, next January. Uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of good work, and, and if I could just offer some personal perspective on this. You know, I think, and I've, I've said this before, it's a very, it's a very beginning, it's not something I would have voted for, but I see it working, and I want to give a lot of credit to Dr. Zee for one particular way in which it's working. It's working here a little differently than it's working in some other consolidation. But there was a commitment, especially from Dr. Z from the very beginning, to take care of the people who worked at both institutions. So this effort to make sure that everyone had a place in the new university. There's a good reason to do that because there wasn't, wasn't much fat on the bones of either institution. Uh, but it's being done that way. And I, I'm really impressed with I, what I have seen. And that's the thing he says, you may not know very much, but you can learn things quickly. And I think he's learned a great deal about the people at this institution. I'm really pleased to see what he has learned and the favorable impressions that he that he has gained of so many people here. Uh, as we, particularly as we go into consolidation, 
there's a kind of human being, human resource consideration in this consolidation that I think is really, very good. And I'm pleased that it's going in that direction. Now, having said that, let me just offer to answer any questions you might have of me uh, at this point. Let's give him a break. And, you know, you might ask a question. I might, I might actually know the answer to it. Or I might be able to make up a pretty good one. But anyway, let me, we've got the microphones there so everybody can hear all the questions. So let me ask if there are any questions that you would like to address to me. Our meeting's not over yet. The last time that I worked somewhere and I didn't have a staff that reported to me to kind of help me do the work was 1982. I'm now going to be like you, Donnie. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, a faculty member. I'm not going to have a whole staff around me. So it's kind of it's been an interesting experience for me. Okay, so I'll come to you for reference for that. How to, how to, how to do that. Remember, 
we are a little bit different than, than Macon and, and, and Wake Cross, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to be a national brand, right? We're going to be a statewide brand. We're going to be a national brand. So how do the names hold up when they're marketed out through, you know, the rest of the United States and the rest of the state? So we've got a firm company doing some of that work. And so that's being done simultaneously. It's got to be done very well, coordinated, uh, so that we get that piece of information. As soon as we get all that information, the committee again will go back, look through the data, look through the results, this kind of stuff, and hopefully come up with a, a group of three names that then we will suggest to the Board of Regents. Of course, the moment we send it to the Board of Regents, everybody will know, right, because that is a public record. That's the process. Right? I believe that the, the team has gotten down to, you know, the sort of core group of maybe 20 or so or 10 or something names that, that they're going to be working on, and then hopefully over the next week, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more about it uh, this evening at our open uh, consolidated work group meeting. Hopefully, they'll send it out uh, to all of us maybe in a week or two uh, in that regard. So that's really the process that we're doing. Questions about that process? Does that have a guess? Does that have a guess? I have no clue. Don't know. And I've actually asked to not be kept too abreast of things because I really do want the process to work, which is what we're obviously talking to the commission and anybody else that has an opinion about names, let the process work, it'll be transparent, everybody will have a chance to, to, to provide input, and we'll go from there. Right. Other things that we are doing, of course, we are continuing to work with the Consolidated Work Group. Uh, I will tell you that you should be very proud of these work teams. Uh, not, it is not usual, in fact, very rare for a university to dissect itself in to be able to have groups that look at every nook and cranny of every operation of the university. That's pretty extraordinary. You know? The exercise is we've divided the university functions into about 50 odd main work teams, and of course there's another 25 sub teams looking at this. They're working really, really hard, and that allows us to say, okay, what are we going to look like when we become new you? But again, that kind of introspection, that kind of examination, is very unusual. So hopefully we'll actually end up with a much better product as we move forward. It won't be done. It won't be gelled January or February of 2013. But it'll be something that we will do. Those groups are working extraordinarily hard. The CAT, the Consolidation Action Team, is working really hard to coordinate that whole process because we have to hit certain very clear milestones from a time point of view because we have to prepare the application for uh, submission to SAC before October 1st. Right? So we have to work very, very hard to get it in there. You should be very proud of it. You know, Bill and I, we're just, you know, we pontificate, we talk, we do this, we do that, but the reality is the hard work is done by these teams. So that's the process. It's again a, a process that is very inclusionary. Each team is made out of half ASU and half CHSU representatives. Very soon, we won't be worried about who's they and who's us at the end of the day. There's one university. And that is why today, the organizational structure that we're going to see, we're going to present the organizational structure, is an organizational structure of one university. We won't have a sub-provost uh, who oversees the three campuses here and stuff. That's a bad idea. We don't want to create sort of silos. So we will have all deans, medicine, dentistry, business, arts, whatever, and you know, science and whatever, and so on and so forth, reporting to one provost. We will have one dean of students. Can you say something about that? Because I've, I've looked at some other organizational charts, and this is, this is actually a, a little unusual among universities that have medical schools and a health system. Because typically, for example, at the uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, and at Toledo, there's a special privilege and structure given to the person who is head of the medical school. I think at Toledo, the medical school head is also chancellor of the university. And uh, some similar title like that at UAB. And what we have here, and you understand that the, the medical school, the Medical College of Georgia, has what, 461 faculty members. So it is, it is the largest part of uh, Georgia Health Sciences, it will be the largest part of the new university. It's also the part that brings in the most money, you know, because those faculty members work in the clinics and people pay for their services and, and so forth. But, and from the, from the very beginning, and it was really Dr. Z who insisted on this, that we were going to have a structure 
which didn't, at least in the structure, the titles, and so forth, didn't give great prominence to the medical school in that way. So that's why all, all of the deans of all the colleges, medicine, arts and sciences, now to be two, uh, allied health, nursing, graduate students, all those deans on the same level all reporting to the provost. And that's kind of, I think it's just worth remembering that uh, we went about it that way. We went about that way to make sure that in the structure and in the reality of the university as it develops, that every academic program is as important as every other one. And so you cannot create a great university if you don't value that. We, you know, I'm a physician and I obviously am a healthcare individual, but the reality is that we have obviously a, a health system and so on and so forth that brings in revenue. But that does not mean that our mission necessarily is different or more important than, say, the liberal arts or the undergraduate sciences and so on and so forth. We all have a mission to do, and our mission should be to provide excellent and high quality education for future generations. So we have to balance that. This is not about putting medicine down, and I just said say medicine because they are certainly a large college, but this is, again, about the faculty of medicine, who have been very good about this thing, to work together to create a great new university with all of its components, not an overgrown medical school, but a true comprehensive research university. Now, you've heard me talk about research and why we call it a research university. The reason is that universities, in the traditional historical sense, didn't necessarily do research. So there's a new category of research, which actually was created in the United States primarily, where the, there's a fraction of the, uh, of the faculty and part of the mission is to create new research and discovery. That does not mean everybody's going to do research. That does not mean that if you're not a researcher, you don't have a place at the university. First and foremost, we are a university to train and to educate individuals. By the way, education and training, which is you'll hear this, are actually two real words in our vocabulary. Education, acquiring knowledge, training, acquiring skill. In health systems, you can't let people loose just because they have knowledge. You need to make sure their hands actually go with their brain, you know, which doesn't always happen. Uh, so that's why we talk about training and education, so in case somebody wants to defend that. Uh, but the reality is that we are building this great new university. Part of its portfolio will be research, but it isn't for everybody. It's certainly not. We do not make researchers out of educators who are really good. That does not, that's a bad idea. That will be for the deans and the chairs to decide how they want to work that part of their portfolio, right? The research portfolio into their into their colleges and into their departments. Because right? it isn't about making everybody a researcher. Seventy percent of our current faculty at GHSU is not a researcher of significance. Okay? So I think it's important. So those are some of the things we. I'm I'm, I'm seeing. I saw you here somewhere. The other part of this is that while you know, not everybody at George Health Sciences is a researcher and there are great teachers down there, we have great teachers here. We also have, we also have some pretty good researchers here. Uh, Dr. Pocket, the is here. You know, we just got a, yeah, we just got the announcement of your latest grant. So there's a lot, there's a lot of research that takes place here. Now it takes place among faculty members who are not fully researchers. Now these, these are people who are also teaching full teaching loads as well. And we have, and I, I know that, that Dr. Deese knows this, we have this incredible tradition of undergraduate student research, where students are doing research just as he did when he was an undergraduate with our faculty here. So, you know, this is not, a, this is not an institution which is, uh, which is blind to the value of research as part of the education of uh, those people who come to us as students and to the development of our faculty as faculty members. You know this. I think undergraduate research is a very important part of individuals' training. I mean, you may not end up being the researchers in their life, but it allows them to think creatively, to, to, to understand how you address a problem, and so on and so forth. Uh, the opportunity for those students, of course, is going to be very broad. They're going to be able to actually choose, hopefully, from a very large portfolio of in individuals who are doing research, but we do want to support that and continue to develop that. Of course, ASU has already been at the forefront of developing a program for undergraduate research, and we expect that that uh, to continue to grow. The reality is we, at least myself and my team and, and Dr. 
blood work and everybody have really no nefarious secretive plans to actually make ASU or what would have been ASU a smaller campus, a lesser thing. In fact, we want you to grow. We want you to develop the graduate program that you are going to need to do that. You have to do it intelligently, understanding what your market is. But the market, as Dr. Bloodworth indicated to us today, has changed, right? You now have been a locally focused university. And so the ability of you to generate programs really depended on your local students and the local demand, right? And if you didn't have local demand, you couldn't do that. But now you're going to be really having a statewide position. We're going to have to do branding and marketing to make that happen, of course. But you're going to have a statewide, a regional kind of input. So the ability of you to create newer programs that have a larger catchment area will be significantly greater. We have to do it smartly. We can't just, you know, we have to be very, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word frugal, but we have to be very smart about the use of resources. But again, the catchment area of our students is changing and will change. I, 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 could, vouch, I could vouch for that. Uh, I'll be somewhat facetious about the statement, but I think you'll get the message. Uh, Dr. Thies is so aggressive about growing our part of the university that he, he, he kind of has to slow him down. <laughs> and say, no, I'll wait a few months before you propose a law school. Or I'm not, <laughs> sure. I'm not so sure about engineering and luck Ricardo. I know you want to earn an MFA. But, you know, we're not going to be able to do that right away. You know, it may take a little, little while. But I, I can just tell you that, that, that his interest, in, and I'm, I'm still using those pronouns, our part of the university is genuine uh, and strong. Appreciate that very much. I did want to say a word of, 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 about shared governance because I got a question that formed this morning and I, I, I don't know where the faculty member is. I think it's somewhere in here. But uh, uh, So uh, there you are. Good. So I had a question about shared governance this morning. I'm going to have actually Bill help me out here because the question may not fully resonate with how we do business as a health system. Uh, health system and health sciences university. Uh, uh, so the issue is how much shared governance is and what do I think about shared governance? And I truly believe in two things. I believe in shared governance, but I also believe in leadership. At some point, somebody needs to stand up and say, we're going to make a decision. Okay? And I'm a strong believer in that. But in the health sciences university, the faculty are intimately involved, for example, in the budget from the beginning, but the budgets actually come from the department and the chairs and the faculty, and they roll up through our institution. So one of the reasons we don't have a lot of questions uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Scott. Scott, uh, about shared governance at the Health Sciences University is actually our faculty intimately involved in the running of the health system and managing their own research portfolios and so on and so forth. So it's a different kind of uh, venue. They are intimately involved. What they didn't have before was a view of the big budget. What is that? At the end of the day, what's the big budget? That's where we have a committee that actually allows representatives from the faculty and the students, and the staff, and, and administration to actually look at the big budget before it's finalized. But the budgets actually start in departments and should start, uh, depending on the chair, should start with involvement, of course, of the faculty. It's one of the reasons that the question didn't resonate quite as well, but I just did want to bring that up uh, from that point. Other questions that you have, things that are happening, concerns that you may have. <coughs> Hi, Rick Volsky, Psychology. Um, Several questions regarding research. Uh, in terms of your vision, what types of dollar amounts are you looking for if actually you bring in who are going to do research? And where should that be money com uh, come from? Is, uh, for example, NIH money valued more than other sources? Very good question. You know, I think we have to understand that the different professions and the different disciplines have different funding sources. So I think it'd be disingenuous to say, for example, to uh, all the psychology would be one of them, but, but you know, to the arts, for example, or to the business, that they're going to bring in NIH funds and so on. So it is very true that the funding sources vary significantly. Foundations, uh, there'll be certainly NIH and DOD and then NSF, but, but there will be lots of other sources of funding. Some of those sources of funding have significant indirect dollars. Indirect dollars mean that they are they give you additional monies on top of your grant that go to the institution to help support that investigation. The highest indirect dollars come from the NIH and the Department of Defense. Uh, uh, I think NSF a little less. Uh, they provide between 40 and 50 percent per dollar. So they give you another half dollar for every dollar that they give you. And that half dollar is meant to actually provide the overhead, right? To run the lights in the research building, provide the cleaning agents, you know, the secretary. Somebody has to provide that. It's very interesting often when researchers say, I want to have a lab, right? Why can't I have a lab? Well, a lab is an extraordinarily expensive.
expensive thing to run to maintain the bills and so on and so forth. That's where the indirect costs do that. So from a purely monetary point of view, we love to get the high indirect costs grants, and we are going to encourage faculty to apply for those and to be competitive. They're highly competitive, of course. But not all disciplines can do that. I mean, you have to, you know, other disciplines are not going to be applicable to any of those and have to find their own ways of how to do that. And we know that. That's why at the end of the day, it's about the mission, not necessarily the bottom line. I mean, I've told a lot of people, and that you've heard me say this, you know, running a university is big business. Anybody who thinks that running a billion dollar enterprise is a big business needs to go and take one of Mark Miller's classes. I mean, because it is big business. But the point is, it's about the mission. Right? If I have to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to eliminate every department that loses money, I end up with a hospital. <laughs> so you can't do it that way. Uh, but, but so we have to each, each, that's what I'm saying, each dean and each chair is going to have to figure out their own mix of portfolio. I don't know if I answered or tried to avoid your question. Don't you? <laughs> Other questions? I'm a communication. I have a couple of questions. One is a, a vision uh, question. So some of our programs, like communication, don't have graduate graduate degrees, and part of that, at least in our situation, is because we have other universities nearby that have those degrees. So one of my questions is: Are some other rules changing? Are we in a position now because of what? Uh, the Board of Regency wants to see and what you want to see, possibly get some more of those programs with less of the, uh, less fewer of the roadblocks. And my other question is, on a fundamental level, faculty here do work differently than over at GHSU. We're on a 10-month contract instead of a 12-month. Typically, we keep the full load, whereas I understand that your faculty, and soon to be my faculty as well, uh, <laughs> Are, are teaching a, a, a 4 4 course rotation. I'm not entirely sure. So, so let me ask you a question before I answer your questions. And, and uh, how many here have been faculty in a large, comprehensive research university? Please raise your hand. Okay. And this is the answer to you. Okay. There are six faculty in this room that have actually taught at a large, comprehensive research university. Because the answer to your questions, which are very good, I'm glad you said this, is actually in that. If you go to UGA, there is a huge number of faculty that are nine months, ten months, you know, four, four. But there's also a huge number of faculty, I don't know, Carbohydrate Center, the, you know, the uh, veterinary school, the, this and that, I don't know, all the portfolios, who actually work like health sciences. So a large, comprehensive university is actually all about diversity, about heterogeneity in their faculty, right? A student, when they come in as an undergraduate and says, I don't know what I'm going to do, I need some help, or a student who actually is not even prepared for college, but we're providing them an access mission because of our situation, is very different than the student who says, I'm going to be an MD and I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. You know? And the faculty are different. We have to adapt to that. So the reality is that uh, if you begin to examine how large comprehensive universities work, they are very heterogeneous. I had to privilege really of training at Hopkins and then spending 15 years at UAB and then moving to UCLA. And so the answer is, it happens. You know, you have a mix of faculty, people's responsibilities are different. In health sciences alone, we have a large number of educators in this College of Allied Health Science, very few researchers, and they have a very heavy educational load. Of course, you don't measure it the same way we do, but, you know, but that's okay. That's what we need to do. That's what they need to do. We want to build a research portfolio. We do things like we're doing now, right? We create an institute for public and preventive health that allows them and other investigators to come together to create research. But you don't take an educator and say, I'm going to make you a researcher, or take an educator and say, I'm not going to give you that load, because then who teaches, right? So, so from that point of view, I think it's important to, to visualize that. Regarding developing programs, new programs in the border regions, it is true we are all part of one system. And it is true that we cannot be wasteful of resources, both the students' resources as well as the state's. So if we were to propose a program that was, you know, at nine other institutions, it would be hard to justify to me, not just to you or the Board of Regents, to me, what, what, what are we doing this for, right? 
unless we can put a special spin or something like that. I said this earlier to the, to the faculty uh, policies committee. Right? We need to be smart. Okay? And the low-hanging fruit uh, is, again, to figure out what unique programs we can create within our unique structure that we have here. Right? I mean, that interface between the health sciences and the liberal arts, the, and the sciences, the, those are unique. It, it, it's not about medicalizing the institution, but that's the low-hanging fruit that we should be dealing with today, because you know what we are, and nobody else is? We are the state's academic health center. End of story. So that's where we need to start working on that. But I, but I can't tell you that if we have multiple programs around us that we're going to be able to justify it even internally because there's not going to be enough students. Anymore. But that's a great question. Let me focus for a minute on uh, the potential for the future. I was really, really interested yesterday to see uh, all the information about the creation of the Institute for Public and Preventative Health at, at uh, George Health Sciences University. That's, been created with a lot of work and six, at least $6.2 million of external money and I think maybe more. If you look at that material and you know, look what, what it's, it's to do, you know, and Dr. Aziz has spoken to this, you look at, at, the, at the health problems in the state of Georgia, all of the indicators, you know, low birth weight children, um, obesity, infant mortality, Georgia looks like, statistically, it looks like a third world country. And so this is a massive, important effort to do this. And there are some three dozen or so researchers involved in that effort right now at George Hale Science University. They come from around the university. Nobody, nobody has, I've learned all this this morning, I've learned this part this morning, you know, they don't have appointments in the institute. They have appointments in the department. And, and that kind of thing, and maybe that, in particular, opens up all kinds of opportunities for us. Now, public health is going to involve more than just doctors. It's going to involve people in business. It's going to involve I mean, people in communication, social work, uh, political science, psychology. It's just a great, it's, it's the kind of thing that I now see that a comprehensive university can move forward on. It can not only benefit the community and the state, but can create some new opportunities for many of us to contribute. No, I, I think the, the, for, for those of us, the opportunity for collaboration in the short term so that we can rev things up are great. I mean, you were talking today about creative writing. You know, I, I'm, I want to take a creative writing course. I need that. Uh, all those of you who read my blog know that I need a little help there. But the, the point is, in the field of health science, both in research and in medicine and others, the need for actually ability to express yourself correctly on paper, understanding your differences in audiences, is extraordinarily high. You know, Harvard created a program, Yale created a program, very few. But this is an opportunity for us to actually begin to do that. You know, the business of healthcare. I mean, heck, we could line up MDs and DMDs and other health professionals and start taking these courses. I'm not saying we need to medicalize this, but let's capitalize on our partnership in the very short term. Because those are things that we cannot be argued that we can actually do. And plus, we need to develop other courses. I mean, I was learning, for example, about you know, courses regarding musical therapy or education in music. And so these are things that we have preeminence. We have to be smart, but we will need to grow. Because I will tell you that the one thing we must do is to grow. We have to succeed by attracting more students to our institution, attracting more faculty more research on this. And that's really what will that'll be our success as a university in general. Good question. Yeah. Fine work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Z. Uh, Chad Stevens from Chemistry and Physics. Uh, moving forward, I have a question about the sort of process. We're talking general here. Kind of follow up to the question of, that came over here, talking about uh, thinking about a new graduate program. Uh, <laughs> For individual departments or, or groups that, that are thinking about such things, what's the process moving forward? Um, what do those groups or departments need to do? How, how do we get the discussion going about new programs? How do we find out what's the vision going to be for, say, for say science? I know we're in an early stage here, but is there anything you can tell us about moving forward in the next few months? So, so I think part of your question, like most, is 
we're inherently we're in a nervous state. So, uh, but, but let me tell you my thoughts. These are rough thoughts, and, and you and I have talked about this because I hear something just to take that. Um, because it's an important question. We need to understand, we meaning the, the cell, and certainly whoever the administration uh, structure is going to be, to understand how these decisions are made now. We, in our, that's why shared governance is very important in our institution, we rely very heavily on our chairs and their faculty and their division directors to, to sort of identify opportunities for us. I, I'm not an expert in the entire field. I come to my team and say, these are national trends that we need to capitalize in. These are things, you know, public health is a national trend. We gotta, but, but, but at the end of the day, the, 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 the specifics of those things, the specifics, for example, about what teaching we're going to do within the public health context with what initiatives, those are I'm actually going to be leaving to, to the people who are the experts, the directors and the chairman and so on and so forth. And I would expect that the same thing. So the process for me is one of faculty proposing the process, chairman taking it forward. But it may not always work that way, and so we may have to have a, a process outside of that that actually reviews programs. So we have a business process in our own institution that looks at program proposals, looks at the budget, everything has budgetary implications and proceeds to approve those on a very rapid fashion. I will tell you the one thing that I will be very concerned about and that I will be working to streamline is the pace of decision making one way or the other. The reason is you can have the luxury of making decisions, you know, a lot of consensus and thinking and so on if your competition is only local, right? There's, there's nobody competing with you. But once you start all of a sudden being competing with USC up in Columbia, or UGA, or you know Columbus State, or whoever it is you're competing, the pace of response is critical. You've got to do this fast, either way. So we're going to have to look at those systems and figure out, are we being responsive to it in a rapid fashion or not? Either way, you know, you may say no, not this year, or no, never, or whatever it is, or yes, we're going to do it, and let's identify resources. So I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know how the process is currently. And in our institution, to be fair, at Health Sciences University, we don't propose lots of new programs. You know, we just don't don't have a plethora of new programs. That's why the real growth potential, and you need to understand this, the real growth potential <coughs> of this consolidation is at this university. If the Health Sciences University grew by 10% or 25%, which is our, our current goal is to grow our, uh, our Health Sciences University student population, by 25 percent by 2020. That would be about 800 students. A thousand if you stretch it. But if you grow 15 percent, you're talking about adding six, seven, eight thousand students. So the growth potential is here. That's why all of you who worry about, I'm not sure we're going to get invested in growing. Listen, money is difficult. It is tight. But the growth plans primarily are going to be centered around the undergraduate, liberal arts, humanities, and the other programs that we have here. We're going to be growing the health sciences, but we don't have a lot of growth. We are the sixth largest medical school in the country. We are the only college of dental medicine in Georgia. We're the largest graduate nursing program in Georgia. We're the largest college of allied health sciences in Georgia. Yeah, we get bigger, but not a heck of a lot more bigger. So. We need to figure that out because we need to do it rapidly. And I think that's probably what you're referring to. Great. Good question. Okay. <coughs> Speaking on the topic of growth, um, as an active member of my fraternity, Delta Chi, here, and an active member of the Greek community on campus in general, I think a lot of us are wondering what your thoughts about the Greek system are and if you're willing to uh, support our overall mission to grow during the consolidation and afterwards. Good question. Uh, I will tell you that I will have to learn more about the Greek culture. <laughs> because when I was a young man, uh, it didn't really quite, you know, Greek culture didn't quite always work together, okay? So I don't know. The point is I need to learn more. <laughs> so I'm willing to be educated about the mission uh, and, and how it works into life. I do understand, though, that it is part of the life of the students. And it is something that, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not unsupportive. I'm uneducated about it. Right, good question. I will say that we've seen real growth in that 
here at Augusta State University in the last five or ten years. And, and what you see, I can remember one time that a, an official from, help me out, Gina, uh, or somebody, official you know, from the National Organization of what's called Female Fraternities, we call them sororities, Penland and Council, Penland and Council was here, and it was addressing the members of our female fraternity sororities, and they were within this room. Everybody was really dressed up nicely and so forth. And what I remember most about that is, is this person who's saying, now look, you got to a point here where you can start looking forward to the time when your daughters or your sorority at this university. And I think that was really kind of a tipping point for us as we move forward, becoming a full-fledged real university. I think that will continue in the future. I'm here to learn. I'm a, I'm a quick learner, but uh, but I but I will tell you when I don't know something, I have no problem telling. Other questions? Right here. I can wait for a mic, but I can probably yell pretty good too. <laughs> Rich Leonard from Biology. Um, one of the real real benefits of this university for our undergraduates is, is our class size. The fact that we really form relationships with our students. We get to know them because we're teaching relatively small numbers in our classes and we're teaching our own lab. Uh, going forward, um, do you envision us uh, uh, maintaining that type of a ratio of student to, to, to teacher or do you envision us moving toward a larger lecture format? So I will, I will tell you that I, um, you know, I have a daughter here who's a student who actually values that, uh, that, that proximity. But I'd be disingenuous if I told you that I had the answer and that there are not challenges ahead. Okay? As I said earlier, we are trying very hard to ensure that we preserve employment for the vast majority of individuals, that we are giving everybody a chance to, to do this. But at the same time, there are pressures, both from the legislator, the governor, the chancellor, and others, appropriately so, to make sure that we produce value and we have savings. Now, we can have savings by cutting things, we can have savings by growing without adding a lot more resources, at least in the short term. So I can't tell you that the class size will stay exactly the same in the short term. I think that would be disingenuous, and I would actually ask the faculty to actually come up with some thoughts about how we can do that, how we can generate some short-term growth without expanding brutally the size of faculty, because actually then we will be under pressure, and I can tell you, once the the, the, once the individuals who fund a large part of our operations, which is the Board of Regents and the Governors, decide that we are wasting resources, because again, there's only a limited amount to go around, then they will make decisions for us, and I would rather we make those decisions. Do I envision going to classes of 100, 150, and so on and so forth? I don't think so. Certainly not in any visible you know, future that I can see that. Uh, but do I envision being smarter, trying to be more flexible, trying to figure out how can we do this in the short term, without having to let people off, I think there are ways. Other questions? Professor Hancock, speaking of students, when you, um, I got to go ahead. Speaking of students, when, when you uh, are working on your consolidation plan and everything, is there going to be a physical master plan as far as how many dorms are going to be there or where they're going to be? Or That's a great question. So. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we all need to address uh, in any growing university is physical plant. You know, you, you, at the end of the day, you know, it is true that faculty want us to recruit more faculty, but it's also true at the end of the day that if you don't have enough classrooms, you don't have a research place, you don't have offices, you know, you can't actually, you could, but you know, double wide trailers on the lawn, but it doesn't really do what you want it to do. Okay? So we need to begin to think about facilities. We also need to think about facilities for students. Remember, if we're going to be trying to attract a more residential student body, not just a, not just a, a commuter student, but a residential student that's coming in from Atlanta and other places that are growing, we're going to have to have dorms and recreational facilities and dining rooms and so on and so forth for them. And so we're beginning to explore how to do that in a relatively short period of time. Of course, short period of time when you were working within a university setting is not as short as you'd like it to, but in a short period of time. Uh, but, but having said that, having said that we can identify immediate needs that we need to address, we will have to have a master plan. We'll have to have an idea 
after all, what we're going to do, how we're going to work with all these campuses, how we're going to distribute effort, how we're going to find the investment, what's the 10-year plan, what's the 20-year plan. And we will start that relatively soon after consolidation. Uh, as you know, strategic planning is already beginning today. Now, we have a Transformation 2020. It's a strategic plan for the health system that we just completed. It's not going to change a lot because it's the health system uh, and the health sciences, and, and, and that is okay for them to have a plan. There's an ASU plan that was done two, three years ago. Now we need an overarching university plan, and part of that plan will include doing a update to the master facility plan so we understand what we have. You know, we were having master facility planning for ASU in its own world, and health science camps on its own world. We're not that world. We're now multiple uh, institutions, and I think it's important for us to do that. So we have to do that, and that's a very, very good question. We're going to do that relatively soon. The problem is we can't wait for that to be completed before we start addressing some of the most obvious needs, particularly around our student needs. Does, does that answer that question? Yes. Okay, great. Other questions uh, for us? So I think we have to distinguish between work product and communications, you know. Uh, everybody wants to have a say about everything. Uh, the work teams are putting together uh, items. They are presumably getting information from their various constituencies because that's what they represent. But we have nothing to show. There's nothing to show yet. And unfortunately, we don't have anything to show yet, which is a problem with our timeline. But we're going to get there. So there's nothing for them to show uh, in, a, in a public way. Once we have reports that have actually been filtered and cleaned and so on and so forth, because the last thing you want to do is put out half-baked stuff, because that's only going to cause reactions for people. Then they're going to be posted on the public website, the consolidation website. People will comment, we'll get feedback, and we'll move from there. Uh, very similar to what we did, we're doing about the name, very similar to what we did about the mission and vision values, which, by the way, we changed dramatically based on the input of individuals. Again, most people had actually approved them without change, but we still felt that we needed to listen to the people who actually had comments to do that. And they were changed fairly dramatically if you go back and look at your mission the way we looked before and the way, the way after. But you can't do that uh, half-baked. And I think there's a difference between communicating transparently before you make a decision and having your homework as you're scribbling. I mean, you know, any of you who write stuff, you don't exactly want to be posting your every draft on the net for people to comment, but once you have something clean, you've thought it through, then you can do that. So that's all I can say about that. Uh, you know, I also wrote that communication is like dropping a pebble. Communication in an <coughs> academic center is like dropping a pebble in the tar pit. Because it is, you know, you can make the effort to, you know, have a forum, and then it doesn't go around. You know, nobody talks to anybody else about it. Nobody says anything other than the negative stuff. Of course, that goes very, very, very well. <laughs> and so the point is, we need to all of us here have an obligation to keep people informed. You know, there's a lot of panic out there. Am I going to lose my job? What? I'm going to bring my medical student back to teach business? I mean, I, what's it going to happen? You can't do that. But there's a lot of this that we should be helping allay the fears. But it is true. There's not a lot of ripple effect on this. And, uh, and we want it to happen. Yeah. But it's a good question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, Lisa Miller from Reese Library. I have a question about the interim president. July 1st. I'm wondering what um, you think uh, her role will be and what she'll do when she uh, comes here so, for the so, six months that she's here. So I'm going to have Bill answer as well, but you know, I presume, I, I've only spoken to her once and I don't know her personally. I'm actually very delighted that they picked somebody that is a national caliber of people. I mean, this is a national caliber uh, president. Ran right? two universities, last one ran 14 years, an AAU university, liberal arts uh, expert. I'm really pleased that it wasn't just some plug and play, just okay, we're just going to.
going to need somebody to put them in there. Okay? So that's the good news. Uh, the, the, but she's going to run the campus. I mean, like the president. I'm, I'm not the president, and Bill's going to be retired, and she's going to have to run it. Somebody has to run it. So hopefully we'll get some lots of ideas from her and that kind of stuff. Is no, that better or you better? Oh, but I know my conversation with her. She's just eager to come here, eager to learn about this institution, this kind of institution, do the best job she can. In the seven months, she'll be here. I think she'll be good for it. Yeah, I understand there was a bit of arm twisting to get her to do that. She was pretty happy, you know, doing whatever she's done. But, but again, you know, uh, you know, we all want to contribute to our mission, you know, and so uh, when people say, you know, we really need you here at the Zoom. But again, this was done through the Chancellor's office. I've only spoken to her twice. She has a very deep southern twang. Oh, she's from, <laughs> from Texas. So I don't know that she's from Texas. Texas. But like the Chancellor said, if she's, you know, she's a Texan, survives in New York, she must really have hook spots. So all I can say is I'm looking forward to meeting her. I think she probably has a lot to teach us on many, many different levels. Not every day that you get a president that's actually wearing a nose ring and teaching and doing a lot of that. Uh, but, but her job would be to be the president for as many seven, eight months uh, until she talks. I have this question. Whatever presidents do, is it, what is the president doing? You've spent a lot of time with ASU people the past few months. You've spent a lot of time with them today. And so I have a question for you. Uh, you, know, you really are a fast and a good learner. And so here you are learning about all these people in these institutions. What are some of the most interesting things that you have learned about Augusta State University and its people? Well, you know, I will tell you, what I've learned is, one, you're very dedicated to student education, which is one of the reasons that I actually was willing to bring my daughter here, to be very fair. I mean, first, I wanted her close to home for all the good reasons. But two, I was really happy. You are really dedicated to student education. You're not going to see that very different. Most of your colleagues, if not all of your colleagues, uh, in the health sciences are also dedicated to that. I mean, it's a very important part of what you do. The athletics is actually something that I have very little knowledge. I tell Clint there, I don't know what Clint is, but I tell him all the time, you have to educate me about athletics, because I was a guy who was always left at the last, no, you can have, no, I don't want to do that. So, I don't know much about athletics, you know, so that's a very, it's fascinating to me how the world of athletics really revives a university and how it does, so I'm going to have to learn a lot about that. You know, the, the issue of music, I mean, I was having, uh, with Dr. Morgan and the uh, Master of Zion, so we're having a whole conversation about it. To me, it was fascinating because I thought I understood music because I had 1,500 CDs, so you know, who doesn't, right? But the truth is, the whole complexity of what you teach and how you teach and what the needs are and so on, all of these kind of things are things that I'm learning that I'm having a lot of fun doing it. But again, the most surprising thing to me is the dedication that you all have to student education, and you need to keep that. You need to keep that because our students, in order to be attracted here, are going to be attracted by dynamic professors. My, my daughter, who's no caliber of anything, right, uh, has been thrilled with many of her the professors. And I can tell you, keeping her thrilled is, is hard work. So all I can say is uh, that's what we want. There's, the value of the new university isn't going to decrease because at the end of the day, the growth will be based on our development in, in, the, in programs that will attract more students that will want to come here. I asked a question this morning about faculty role and budgeting. I'm not going to go there, but I do have another faculty role. I try to, answer, I try to preempt you. you know, to right. answer that. I, the question on faculty role I have this time is about the College of Arts and Sciences. There really wasn't much of a faculty role in the decision to split those two. Uh, now that the decision is made, uh, there will have to be a search. Uh, we have a president that's going to be here for six weeks, and then we're, we're going to be here for six months, and then you. And the question that I have is the process. What is going to be the process, and what will be the faculty's involvement in a search process and in the presidential shuffle in coming up with the new president of the yet-to-be-named College of Science? And related to that, uh, the process in deciding which pieces of what go in which college. I mean, where does anthropology go and all those other things? There's a question of process that I'm asking. So let me ask, let me try to answer that a little bit. As far as the pieces of work go where, I'm going to have to rely on the academic officers. This is, this is truly things that I don't 
micromanage, and I don't think a president should micromanage that kind of uh, decision making. Right? Uh, I can right micromanage the bigger vision. Right? In other words, I can say we're going to invest more in the arts. humanities and arts is going to be different than the growth in the science program because in fact we sort of know something about science from the health sciences center that can be of synergy but we don't know much about that so we need to have focus at the end of the day the one thing we're going to see change in leadership as we grow is that people will become less generalist and more focused because when your portfolio gets bigger you just cannot have four different hats i mean you just cannot do that uh, but but I can't tell you about what divisions are going to go. I'm going to have to rely on the academic officers. We'll talk to the deans. We'll talk to chairs. And hopefully, they'll come up with some decisions. But I will tell you, I would use church as currently, and this is in the way that I would like to see church as done next year. The church is going to do her leadership are very inclusive, with very few exceptions. We have recruited a huge number of leaders from Health Sciences University in the last seven months. It is a very inclusive process. It's a long Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you much.